Go. Three sheets. South Africa. With Zane Lamprey. Esquire. Every night, in every city around the world, it happens. People pour into local watering holes to, well, drink. It's my mission, that's me, to traverse the globe, getting to know these different people and their drinking customs. Bellying up to the bar, and with any luck, making some new friends. <laughs> Warning! When in Cape Town, beware of the mystery shots. It was awful. You'll see more of that later, but first... Ah. Cape Town, South Africa's second most populous city, but number one tourist stop. And for my purposes, a drinking destination of unparalleled diversity. You could be on pristine mountain slopes sipping fine wines. Yeah, that's very complex, right? You might find yourself in a sprawling township sipping booze from a bucket. What did we say? Cheers. Or you could just cut loose in a totally off the hook party scene. That was so dumb. Mother <laughs> Bottom line, the drinking here runs the gamut. And therefore, as one who is burdened with the heavy responsibility of hosting the world's greatest drinking show, I too shall run the gamut of drinks and see if I have what it takes to go... Rishi's Pizza! I begin my drinking adventure by taking a little ride up a big hill. Holy sh**. Oh, my God. <laughs> this is Table Mountain overlooking Cape Town. Ah! <laughs> Whoa! Is that awesome? Is that off track? In the foothills surrounding Cape Town, lie vast expanses of vineyards. And somewhere out there is a legendary South African winemaker named Charles Back. I've got a finger missing as well. Do you want to see that? Where I, is it? I, I should hide it in here. Okay. What happened? You, you broke it off in the bottom of a bottle? No, I got corked. Did you really? Yeah. What happened to it? When's the bottle? I corked it. So if you ever find a bottle of Fabi with my plumbing, please return to sender, okay? <laughs> he might be short one thumb, but he's not short on wines. Here at his Fairview estate, about an hour outside of Cape Town, you can sample his many wines labeled under a variety of names. And as a goat farmer, he's also known for making some of South Africa's most prized cheeses. But today, I've come to talk specifically about a line of controversial wines that he says were created by his goats. Okay, Goats de Rome, coincidentally linked to an area in France called the Côte de Rhone. Okay, before going any further, to clarify an important point, Côte de Rhone is a wine region in France. And in classic French tradition, it's been labeled an official wine appellation. Meaning that much like you can't call sparkling wines champagne unless they're from the Champagne region of France, you cannot call wines Côte de Rhone unless they're produced in France's Côte de Rhone wine region. And though his South African wine, Goats de Rome, may have a similar sounding name, Charles says that's just a strange coincidence. You know, we got this goat tower, which you have seen. Yes. And one day my naughty son, son Justin and Jason, opened the gate. As the story goes, his goats escaped from this tower and took to the vineyards where they began feasting on grapes. But apparently, they were very selective about which grapes they ate. Uh, there was a pattern, so I got the lady from the lab with a clipboard and I said, do me a favor, follow these goats <laughs> and you let me know exactly which grapes they are eating. So it turns out that by some eerie coincidence, the goats feasted on the same grape varieties that have been used for centuries to make the similarly named Côte de Rhone wines of France. We slipped this, this wine into a tasting of French 
Cote de Rhone. We got into a serious amount of trouble when this beat the majority of the French wines in the tasting. And then the French authorities objected because they thought it was very close to Cote de Rhone. I can't see, can you see it? Well, no, but you know, we have an expression. Um, I don't know if you guys use the same one. Um, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, that's very complex, right? Complex, but yet soft, easy going. Yeah. Priced at around 10 bucks a bottle, it's become South Africa's top selling brand of wine in the States. And Charles tells me that this success is due in large part to this guy. Oh is this something else the goats did? Sure, no. In did you do any of your own work? No, you it's said the goats do this. So okay. This is re our goats reacted to a situation. Okay where the French objected to us using the, the name Goats to Rome. But fortunately, our goat herd had a distant cousin, and he's the goat father. Charles, you're crazy. <laughs> he protects his supply lines and continuity, wow. and but uh, make sure that they get to your market. Is that one of the guys that lives in the tower? Um, he actually, uh, he doesn't oh, disclose where he is. Don't worry a, about it. Don't worry about it. Okay. Okay. But got believe it. me, he's around. Yeah, he's okay. around. <laughs> okay. If I need him. If you need him. Yeah, okay, okay, got it. <laughs> Not surprisingly, this wine is reminiscent of a big, bold Italian red. Wow, that is spicy smoky, huh? He says it's a blend of Italian varietals with some French grapes thrown in to create a subtle, ripe fruit taste. But that's all he'll tell me. Apparently, any more information, and the goat father and I would have to have a sit down. Not good. The, the goat's Jerome, capiche? <laughs> okay, I get it, I won't say a word. Anyway, I'm hungry. And I'm told to have a truly South African dining experience, I should head back to the heart of Cape Town to a restaurant called Kaya Niyama, which means house of meat. Game. I like games. I like games a lot. Here, you can pick your meal of meat by pointing to one of the dead animals on the walls. Justin, who owns the place, says that like a lot of people in Cape Town, he drinks a South African brandy called Clip Drip. 86 proof, so it's quite strong. And he says it's very common yeah. for South Africans to drink it much like Americans drink whiskey. It's just cola, nondescript. Justin says that the cocktails are the perfect warm up to the five different courses of South African game he's about to serve me. Oh, Justin, what did he do? Look at the face on that guy. Look how cute he is. Have you tasted how good he tastes? Does it taste good? Very good. Take two, please. First up, ostrich, which in these parts they call big chicken. Ostrich, love it. Now, meat number two. It's a bit of aphrodisiac. This is? It is. <laughs> you keep your hands off me. It's crocodile, which I think tastes a lot like the other white meat. Like pork. As for meat number three, it's kudu. That's him over there. This is, I mean, this would be similar to like an elk or something. Meat number four is this handsome devil, warthog. And the finale, a skewer containing this guy, springbok. Wow, good. Those are really good. Justin tells me it's also a good warm-up to a drink he wants to serve me, appropriately called Springbok. You put your head there, we've got three up behind the bar. Three what? Arsels. A Springbok, the drink, starts with Butler's South African Peppermint Liqueur. Then, with a spoon to keep the two separate, a little Amarula on the top. What's Amarula? It gets its name from the Marula tree which cannot be cultivated and grows wild throughout sub-equatorial Africa. The fruits from these trees are picked, fermented, distilled, and mixed with cream, creating the 17% cream liqueur that you see coming out of that spring box ass right there. Uh, sweet. On that note, I think it's time to call it a night. It's been a nice first day in Cape Town, but it's just a warm up for what tomorrow will bring. Coming up, something I probably won't find in my hotel lounge. It's called um umboot. 
Um, um, boy. Um, um, boy. And later... You either love to hate it or you hate to love it. But it's a killer. It's day two in Cape Town, South Africa. And I'm gonna start my day at the waterfront. No, not that waterfront. This waterfront. It's absolutely nowhere near the water. In fact, it's smack dab in the middle of an area called Cape Flats. While there's no exact data, it's estimated that over a million people live within this massive township. And where there are people, there are bars. Or, as they're called in the flats, shabines. Like this one, where I'm gonna drink with this guy. Un fundo. Un fundo. Yes, yes. Am, did I right? Say it. Say it again. Un fundo. Un fundo. Yeah. Un fundo. Fundo. It's M F. M F U N D O. How did you know it's an O? Oh, well, that's was it gonna be an E. Un fundo. It's zero and O, same thing. Really? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. M F U N D zero. What's your name? Zane. Zane. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so you're gonna introduce me to something. I don't even know what it's called. It's called um umboot. What? Um um o o bo bo t t um o bo bo t. Very good. Don't ever make me say it again. <laughs> it's a lot like beer, but instead of barley, it's a fermentation of cornmeal and sorghum, prepared outdoors over an open campfire. Yeah, outside. Okay. Not inside. Outside. Okay. That's how originally it's done. Okay. Presumably, the fact that it's done outside allows naturally occurring yeast to settle into the mixture, which converts the starches to alcohol, creating what in a few days is kind of an unfiltered beer-like beverage. What did we say? Cheers. <laughs> Don't say cheers. Everything else was all these cool words, and now you say cheers? No, it's tulo. It's tulo. It's tulo. It's tulo. It's tulo. It's tulo. <laughs> I taste a little fire in it. I taste a little charcoal. I taste the maize. You know, I mean, it tastes, it tastes like a campfire. Because it was done. Because it was done over a campfire. Okay. Tastes like camping. Yes. And we use it in the camping cups. And then, oh, we're using it. Maybe that's, maybe that's why. It's dulo. It's dulo. It's dulo. Yes, yes. <laughs> After knocking back a buzzworthy amount of mmobot. That's right, I've been practicing. Mfundo directs my attention to what at first glance looks like a couple of milk cartons. So that it can blend together. Oh. Apparently, you're supposed to shake it with an attitude. Oh, shake, it. Yeah, shake, shake, shake. What we're shaking, by the way, is definitely not milk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First, the ajuba, which is a commercially produced version of the homebrew he showed me earlier. All right. <laughs> yeah. It's, it tastes very similar, mm -hmm. but it doesn't taste like a campfire. You know what? I prefer the original. It's dulo to that one. It's dulo to that, to that one. Yeah. Yes. As for the other milk cartony thing, Basically, it's the same as the stuff we just had, but with more malt. Mfundo, what do you got there? It's Chibuku. What? The beer of Africa. Wow. I could drink with Mfundo all day long. But in the interest of pursuing a wide range of drinking experiences during my short stay in Cape Town, I leave Cape Flats and head to a more affluent part of town to drink at a bar called Rick's. This is Billy. He owns the place. And he's allowed me free reign to drink as I please behind his bar. But I won't be going at it alone. Take a cigarette, put it in your hand, and then... This is Ferdy. Okay, you like my cigarette now? Yeah, sure. Watch ah! it. Don't blame. <laughs> and that's his gag electrical charged lighter. 
He won the game slash reality show Big Brother South Africa. But what's more important in Three Sheets Land is that he drank more alcohol than any participant has ever consumed in the history of that series. <laughs> and in classic South African form, he orders up some Clip Drift and colas. But I drank those last night, so let's fast forward to something different. Brandy and orange juice. Actually, no. Let's speed ahead to something a bit more exotic and hard to come by here in the States. There, that's good. This is a type of viplets. You can try it out of the bottle, brother, but I will not suggest that. More specifically, Klein Plassi Viplets, which is a small mom and pop company from the South African town of Wooster. And since Ferdy is from Wooster, he knows all about it. And he thinks it's imperative that I, Zane Lamprey, experience it for myself. But first, what is this stuff anyway? Professor! The mad scientist. Oh, yes, Zane. Diplet. That's white lightning to you and me. Was popularized by Dutch winemakers who settled in South Africa in the 1600s. It's a hard alcohol distilled from the discarded grape byproducts of the winemaking process. Kind of like Grandpa in Italy. <laughs> Ciao. Ferdy has a few different types of viplets he wants me to try. Starting with this 60 proof version infused with red bush, which is often used to make tea in South Africa. Cheers. 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 This was a nice one. That was very nice. No, 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 it's very nice. That wasn't actually so that bad. But pleasant, eh? All right, the next viplets is 60 proof as well, but it's flavored with fig. Wild, makes you wild. The first one was better. Ferdy tells me that these flavored drinks are just a warm up for what's next. You either love to hate it or you hate to love it, but it's a killer. This Viplets has no added flavors and comes in at a whopping 120 proof. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Good? Is it yeah. really good? Have another one? No, thank you. Apparently, Ferdy won't take no for an answer. <laughs> So before I spiral down into a viplets and do stupor, I ditch Birdie and head for the next bar. Coming up, the leaning tower of mystery shots. When you kill that one and tell us what it is. Right now, I'm in Cape Town, South Africa and I'm headed to a popular bar called Mama Africa. It's a giant snake, you see? So if you follow the bar along the way, you're following this giant snake. You see, it goes back over here. Hi, can I get a, uh, a beverage, please? This is Peter. And the reason he's in this scene with me is because he was sitting there when I sat down. Harry, the manager here, wants me to try the legendary Flaming Ox Wagon. Right, so but he says a, we uh, should ease into it. This is a South African lager. Yes. Castle Lager is South Africa's top selling beer. That guy's hilarious. Cheers. It has an alcohol content of around 5%, and it tastes like, well, uh, mass produced, nondescript lager. But this is just a warm up for things to come because Harry has asked the bartender to bring out a few mystery bottles. They've been sitting here for years. I've never seen anybody order them. They don't know our stock. They just, they're just here. First up, a banana sort of thing. What did it taste like? Rum and raisin ice cream? Yeah. Rum and raisin ice cream. Yeah, you know, yeah. rum and raisin ice cream. Next, something that tastes like a mix of hard liquor, sugar, and wine, because that's probably what it is. I don't know, it was, it was awful. Finally, a peach schnapsy sort of thing. Oh, it's right. Yeah. Hey, but it tastes it's like, not, it's so, it's so it's sugary. Awful. The best part of this round of drinks is the collection of empty glasses, which we give Peter the honor of topping off. 
Jeez, you know. Dude, Jim, you should you should even walk. Home. You know what? I'm pretty good at this. Watch it. I'm pretty good at this. Watch it. Watch it. Watch it. Watch it. Watch it. What are you doing? Uh, uh, Been doing it for years. Oh, uh, there you go. I call that the Tower of Misery. Those shots were um, not so awesome. Time for the moment we've been waiting for. A glass full of tequila, sambuca, herbal liqueur, and stro rum that's lit on fire. In goes a shot of amarula and blue curacao. Finally, they sprinkle it with cinnamon for a little added flair. Sparkles. That, my friends, is Mama Africa's signature flaming ox wagon. And since it's so legendary, it must be good, right? Oh, that's disgusting. And if you don't believe me, believe Peter. Suck it, no, finish more. it, finish oh, it. What is wrong with you? Finish it, finish it. Yeah. No, that was good. On that note, I think it's a good time to call it a night. We did it. We did it. It. We did it. It's the next morning, and I have a monster craving for eggs. What better place to satisfy my craving than at the West Coast Ostrich Farm, about an hour outside of Cape Town? This is the ostrich egg right here. Yes, this is the ostrich egg. Right it's very, like a rock, man. Very hard. Can I break it if I hit it hard? I can't, my friend. I just use this Check tool. Check this out. Maybe you didn't get a load of those. OK. Kalele uses a spoon to chip away a small hole at the top. And then he blows into a straw, forcing air in and egg out. So how many eggs is this equal to? 24. 24 chicken eggs. Yes. Kalele tells me it uh, takes about 30 minutes to scramble one ostrich egg. What can we do in the meantime? Can I go, can I go play with the ostriches in the meantime? Yes, my friend's gonna go. I'll be right back. Now is a good time for a really quick ostrich documentary. One ostrich egg. Adult ostriches are about eight feet tall and weigh about 300 pounds with a potential lifespan of up to 60 years. In full stride, an ostrich can reach speeds of a little over 40 miles per hour. It can't fly, and one ostrich eyeball is twice the size of an ostrich brain. All right, breakfast is ready. It's pretty good. It's, um, tastes like, it tastes like eggs. Tastes like eggs. Mm -hmm. After drinking South African wines that taste and sound eerily French, they thought it was very close to Coterel. I can't see, can you see it? A brew I couldn't pronounce. Don't ever make me say it again. <laughs> and more stuff that rendered me speechless. Oh, that's disgusting. Oh, I managed to survive a charging ostrich and get exactly what I was craving. Thank my friend. I enjoy your eggs, man. Lovely. You got the best eggs in town. Thanks, bro. South Africa. They got some big chickens in these parts. <laughs> cool. Cold. It's just you're just asking for trouble. Have you seen me on tequila? I'm, I'm crazy. Well, you can drink That's three of them. Exactly. Yeah, I can drink eight of them, but I might start humping the snake. Tequila, look at this, and then look at Eric the sound guy. Look. <laughs> Oh, I just got it. Goat father. That's funny. <laughs>